Uh, hello again from me. Um, I have promised a lot to Rafael that I'm going to answer everything in my presentation. So I hope you're. Um, I know that the definitions. What is everything differ from person to person. So let's see. Let's see what I can manage. So I'm coming from Increase Project. Uh, my colleague, a good friend, Professor Kopianis, presented something yesterday regarding an overall. Um, what we are doing in the project, but here I have five, five points that um, I propose that we visit today. One is about the markets and the flexible energy product as the answer to flexibility question. I showed that in Aachen, but I think it's worth revisiting. What is the increased solution? So how are we doing it? Uh, how, how does the DSO actually validate the schedules? And then the relationships among actors that we envision, and if there's some time, also we look under the hood. So these are the markets that we focus on. If we look at the timeline, years, month, weeks ahead, day, hour, minute, second cycles, here's real-time operation and then imbalance setting. And we look at the physical setting for the wholesale market, uh, product stakeholders and reserve market products and stakeholders. This is what we focus on. They had spot market and intraday. Uh, we look at balancing market and we look at tertiary reserve, which is more into weeks, in the, more, weeks ahead. Yeah? Um, and in our solution, we look for this is where our aggregators try to sell electricity in. And then the, the really short-term reserve activation, this is for balancing market, it's just uh, uh, very few minutes before operation. When we talk about flexibility, this is too loosely defined, in my opinion. We say flexibility, what is flexibility? Yeah, it's some quality, but if you want to price it, we need to know where, so what kind of service this is? Because for a service, we need a product and we need stakeholders that are involved or actors who buy and sell. And then we need a market, a market where this is sold. Is it either bilateral or uh, over the counter or organized power exchange, but there has to be some, some kind of a market. So we need a product first. And this is what why I propose or we propose that we use the term flexible energy product. Then we know this is energy. We know that these are kilowatt hours or megawatt hours, and it has a certain price on certain market. Um, we can say it's uh, technical, so independent of the, the technology, so technology neutral, and then we can talk about how to integrate them in the existing markets. We don't have to set up new market for flexibility. It would be nice, but it's, it, I think it distances us from reality. As it is right now, it, it artificially creates this notion of flexibility markets artificially creates the value of death that we need to cross in order to make it operational. If we go for a flexible energy product, we get it immediately and uh, we can start working with it on the existing markets with some modifications on the procurer side, uh, provider side, sorry. Uh, so we would need to, uh, for this flexible energy product, we need to know, for example, these are possible ways, internal price of the providing unit, time of provision, how quickly can it ramp its power, its energy. So in effect, this picture is taken from the Irish TSO. They are trying to define as an ancillary service called ramping capability or ramping. And it's defined how quickly it must ramp from, let's say, 40 to 100 percent. How long must it stay in certain region? There are several uh, products, but this was a service has technical parameters defined and its cost defined. 
so here we show how this flexible energy product could go into reserve, so week ahead and more markets and the energy markets, uh, they had intraday balancing and um, where, which are the stakeholders or the actors that could be interested in these uh, products. Please note that the DS DSO could be part of it, so it could be the user and consumers and commercial entities are the ones, so these are, let's say, producers, consumers or presumers together are the ones that are procuring or, they're, or purchasing them. Uh, another feature that I mentioned yesterday in my response to the question is how does the framework matrix come up? Uh, how, how do we capture all the boundary conditions for our uh, calculations? Uh, we have put together a um, value analysis framework because this was also a question how do we find the value uh, of the investment in, in intelligence versus the investment in the grid, in the, in the cables and transformers. And for this we need to uh, look what, who are the stakeholders, what business models they can use, what is the framework matrix for the boundary conditions for this particular case and then with technical analysis that we run uh, load flows and other uh, control strategies and interaction among agents we come up to certain uh, technical runs then we use the value analysis tool to, to analyze for each business case for each selected framework matrix for selected set of stakeholders what the value is provided and by whom and this will uh, enable us to price our services and also price, also come to the, to the answer how much, so will the DSO consider our intelligence solutions instead of going for the upgrade of the network. Okay? And these are the enabling and modifying parameters that I mentioned yesterday. Uh, Grigoris has shown this picture. We envision several aggregators on uh, the let's say distribution network and each of the aggregator may have some of the demand response units uh, from various feeders under its uh, portfolio. And uh, okay, there are agents, but these agents are just uh, activating agents. They're not intelligent, only the aggregator is intelligent. And the aggregator, in a way, is the entity that has the intelligence to interact with the markets, to interact with its uh, uh, minions, yeah, and with the DSO. Uh, we, the, for demand response, we only said we look for firm demand response because uh, we try to eliminate for this particular uh, case, the need to negotiate and motivate the users, the consumers, to, to give up some of their, some of their um, convenience. And that's why we said, okay, let's go for cold storage, heat pumps, batteries, so anything that could be firm scheduled. And uh, also we considered the balancing intraday and day ahead markets in our optimization and the reserve, we said, is done offline. So whatever the aggregator thinks, he can schedule on the week ahead markets, on reserve markets, this is done and this is taken off the market and from here on we work only on the energy short, shorter term markets, the ahead and below. One of the questions in my discussion with uh, people in the winter school was how does the DSO validate the schedules? How, how, does, this, how does this happen? Because the DSO, in, uh, so we have three DSOs in our project and they all say we are non-commercial entity and the regulator pro prohibits us to get, do anything that could either put us directly on the market or that would, that would uh, put us in the um, moral hazard position where we could, through some of our decisions, make 
uh, so uh, create imbalances in the market towards one or the other player or make profit for ourselves because of our privileged position. So how we do it is the aggregator, the agent, gets through the market input, schedules, uh, the, 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 um, yeah, the schedule of demand response units. This demand response schedule goes to the DSO. DSO does the load flow check and PQ violations, we're talking current congestion over voltages. If there, are any, uh, if there aren't any, then the schedule is sent to demand response units. This is day ahead. It can also be done intraday and then it's also done 50 minutes ahead. We call this real-time check. Uh, but if there are violations here, if they're caused by demand response, uh, if once demand response schedule is put on the prepared schedule for the next day and there, there are violations, then this traffic light system we put together, we propose, would um, be activated and it would require change of the uh, schedule. So the, cir the, the, the cycle goes again until there are uh, so, so um, the schedule is then improved. Um, unfortunately, this picture jumped up. So we wanted, so we needed to put the DSO always in control. And this is why we devised three types of traffic light system. And the two questions are, does the joint load schedule of demand response and whatever dress or PV units are producing, are there any PQ violations because of that? And the second question, does the demand response schedule help or, de uh, or um, act detrimentally to the, to the security of, of the schedule? And in simple, simple traffic lights says, violations, no violations, we accept it. Viola uh, yes, violations, we throw it out. Advanced one checks the direction and it re rejects the schedule only if the violation goes, uh, uh, just, you know, uh, drags the whole ship down. Intelligent uses already um, interactive 15 minute algorithm that uses forecasting and uh, also helps the schedules be, uh, um, tries to avoid coming to any um, uh, uh, violations. This is an example for n units for 24 hours and each of the unit is either activated with one, it, with zero or minus one. Uh, uh, I'll show uh, in the next slide what this means. But if the unit is activated plus one, so it consumes more, or minus one, it consumes less, demand response unit, um, then in simple traffic light, if there is PQ violation in this hour, then simply all the units are switched off in this hour. What happens when they're switched off? They, they are thrown out of the schedule and the, the aggregator gets the information that they are released. So this energy in this hour is available for any subsequent uh, optimizations intraday or on, on the shorter term um, the, he, can, he can go and try again. They are released to the pool and the pool is three-dimensional, so units, uh, market segments and time-wise, so hours, so it can um, get the, this energy back and it tries again with the next offers. In advanced case, only the ones that are, so in case of under voltage, only those that are uh, helping in under voltage are kept and in the overvoltage, only those that are helping with overvoltage are kept. So this is how we specified our demand response units. Uh, in a house, there is regular load, which is not, we don't touch. It goes with the, with the regular load profile. And then there is demand response load, which is, with, when it's set to zero, it's halfway. When it's set to one, it's, it's full power. And when it's set to zero, it's to zero. Oh, um, so, sorry, when it's set to minus one, it's actually set to zero. And we wanted to make it as 
close as possible to storage because it's much easier to play with it when it has plus and minus because we want it to be demand response units to be able to provide both a positive and negative reserve. So time of use again, when is it available? This is when we use it. Energy constraints, we say, okay, there's only so much energy available during the day. Um, that, let's say, a uh, cooling facility is available to devote to this play. Uh, we assume that uh, there's on only a fixed power that it can be scheduled, not, not uh, a little more. So we just made three increments, zero, half or full. Uh, there is some internal unit price that helps with um, optimization of the aggregator. We didn't envision internal market that there would be then. So this, this is all um, additional dimension that we could implement. So it's not against. We just said, okay, let's simplify. Let's, let's make one case that works. And other assumptions, we didn't penalize the aggregator for unsuccessful activation. Because when the DSO throws the demand response unit out, it's not activated. So we said, OK, uh, it's not remunerated for that. I'll show this a bit later. And um, one more thing, we assumed full energy payback. Within 24 hours, what, whatever energy is reduced for demand response unit, it will be fed back by the end of the day. So full circle. Uh, this is the activation. Blue uh, lines denote the hours of time of use that unit can be used. And red means it's activated plus one, it's activated minus one, or it's activated to zero. So this is how uh, we use this um, activation. For the actors that we uh, looked into, so of course the DSO, the aggregator which in our case is also the retailer and the balancing responsive party. So it's the market actor, the one that has the ability and the finances to invest into knowledge of forecasting and knowledge of the markets and all the memberships on the different power exchanges and so on. Oops, sorry. And then we have uh, demand response units. We have the PV units there. Uh, and the then we also have the energy market and the national feed-in tariff uh, agency because uh, we looked at three cases where PV units are being uh, remunerated. Um, but most importantly, uh, the aggregator is our center of figure that is able to access the markets. Um, and so three slides to explain what uh, the uh, and how do they, the actors interact? One is what do they do? Second is how much does this cost them? And third one is what do they earn this way? So what are the income? So we said that aggregator um, sells the, so selects the scheduling optimization method. Either sell as much demand as this, uh, this flexible energy on the markets or try to help the demand uh, the, the DSO with its um, imbalances and at the same time try to get as much green energy from uh, distributed generation injected in the network. So look for minimization of the imbalances. PV unit owner office offers the electricity on the market either through selling it to the feed-in tariff uh, agency or to the aggregator. And the uh, demand response unit owner supplies electricity, uh, sorry, aggregator supplies electricity to the to demand response unit's owner, and aggregator also schedules its units. PV unit owner sells the electricity to the, to the aggregator, generates, uh, uh, so PV unit owner, uh, we say it participates in increased control, so it has to invest in the smart, smart inverters and chooses the remuneration scheme, whether feed-in tariff, if it's possible, otherwise goes from the market. And demand response unit owner participates in the demand response scheme and consumes electricity, in addition to the inflexible load that's already in its load. So what does this cost? 
the aggregator has to pay for its software. The aggregator, um, from, so it's from this actor to this actor. So we said, okay, demand response unit owners participate in the increase scheme, but for this they get 10% reduction on all, uh, X percent reduction on all their uh, consumption. So demand response, they have to pay for DR unit consumption, but also for their regular consumption. Um, and the PV unit owners, um, they pay for the scheduling um, <coughs> service to the aggregator Y percent of their market-based revenue. So the aggregator provides them access to the markets, sells their energy, and that's why he gets some cut in this market income. Uh, so this is it. And PV unit owner pays for its own smart inverter. And demand response unit owner uh, gets the uh, reduction in the bill, but the aggregator pays for the ADR box. So demand response units don't pay for their capability uh, cost. And for revenues, we said, okay, the aggregator gets a share for, for this or Y or PV of its, this market revenue and uh, demand response unit owners gets the, um, so, so aggregator gets the market income from selling this demand response, uh, this flexible energy. PV unit owner gets additional market revenue if the aggregator chooses to balance the, the um, so helps it with congestion instead of selling it full, full power in the market. Uh, then the PV unit owner yeah, gets the money from selling the energy and the demand response unit gets uh, free flexibility. Uh, so this ADR box, automatic demand response box, and it gets X percent reduction, we said 10% of full, its full bill. So um, from here on, I only have this monster graph showing how did we envision it. Uh, I have each of these boxes in separate slides. So where here reserve market, uh, some of this scheduling is set aside. The head cycle is then run here. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, when some of the demand response, uh, some of the flexible energy from dem demand response units which are um, rejected can be then rescheduled in the intraday and balancing layer. But in real time layer is where the forecasting is used for um, PQ violation uh, control PQ check and then uh, goes to operation if when there are no, no more um, violations. So it's all set back. So this is the detailed explanation how our uh, process works. I don't think we have time to go through this, uh, so I would prefer to answer some of the questions because... Uh, thank you.